thanks for being on the show. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate it. I'm flattered. So you and I uh, have some similar friends in common. Uh, I asked, reached out on Facebook a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know what it was, and said, hey, um, I'm looking for great people who know a lot about business and can help other people with their business who'd love to talk about it on their podcast. And, well, uh, what I checked that last box. I like to talk. <laughs> at, least, at least you got one out of three. That ain't bad. That's right. And, uh, and one of my longtime friends and longtime clients as well, uh, Tom Morrison said, hey, you know what? You need to talk to Dave. And I said, great. So uh, Tom says that I trust it. So here we are. And I was reading through your bio. This is where I want to start. Um, I was reading through the bio and you spent a long time at a very large you know, company. And, and it said that you were told to walk faster and smile less because perception is reality. And then long story short, you uh, ended up leaving there or getting fired from there, I suppose, and then starting your own business, building a culture on the idea of walking slow and smiling more. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so, well, you know, my, my term there actually, I was an intern there it, it, as an MBA in between the first and second year of business school. But you are right in the way that I worked for some, you know, multi-billion dollar companies before I became an entrepreneur. I worked for Kraft General Foods first, Nielsen, um, you know, the ratings company. I, I specifically worked in the consumer goods side, but all big, big data. Um, in my role is always to take technology and apply it to um, business operations uh, to make things more efficient and so on. They call us process guys. We're, we're the ones that are easy to eliminate. You know, the technology, like the, the people writing the code, those are the guys that really matter. I'm just the guy that says, oh, so we got some code here. Let's figure out how to apply that to the business. Um, so uh, the, I remember very clearly that advice and uh, my supervisor for the summer, Mark, he walked me out on my last day and he put his arm around me and which you can't do that anymore. I'm pretty sure you put your arm around people. Yeah, you can't do that. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> and he slapped me right in the ass and he yeah. said, oh, Dave, uh, I encourage you to walk slower. Oh, sorry. The walk faster and smile more. I smile less. Let me try that again. I encourage you to walk faster and smile less because perception is reality. And, uh, at that time, and since very sincerely, I thought that was fantastic advice, and he did too. Like he, this came from a good place. I think he liked me, and he wanted me to be successful in my endeavors. Um, and his observation was like, "This kid just doesn't look busy." Um, I don't even know if he is busy. I don't know if he's doing shit for his job for the summer. Like, uh, but the kid should walk a little faster and smile less because he just doesn't look like he's accomplishing anything. And so I took that to heart and uh, I ended up leaving business school, getting a job for PricewaterhouseCoopers. I went over to another smaller consulting firm. And so this term of working in consulting and uh, it was making good money and working in pr fairly prestigious organizations. And, um, and I, I sincerely believe I tried to walk faster and smile less mm -hmm. because I knew perception's reality. And, and I was very much a chameleon in the way that I tried to interact with people the way they expected me to interact. Needless to say, I was fired um, one morning for lacking a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes hand in hand with with this advice that was given, it all comes together. And so ultimately I ended up starting a, a business. Um, gosh, this was shortly after I was fired. Uh, I started this in 2001, the tech bubble hit and, and reality is it was a good time to let people go. Um, and this was, a, I was a good one to let go at the time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, I started a business on the antithesis of that advice. In fact, I, I would say that's probably one of my personal core values is to walk slow, smile more. And what I mean by walk slow, by the way, it doesn't mean that you should lack a sense of urgency. It doesn't mean that you literally wander around. What that just means is you're walking slow enough to enjoy it. You're walking slow enough to see what's around you, smell the flowers and enjoy the process. Because if you don't enjoy the process, how are you going to produce anything of value? How are you going to produce something great if you don't enjoy the process of making it happen? Because great things rarely happen quickly. 
You go to the gym and you pump some Iron Man. You're working hard, right? And you do that once a week, maybe once every few weeks. You go in and you like grind it out. You notice zero difference except for the two or three days after when it hurts like hell, but zero difference. But if you go to the gym every day and every day you're there and you're working out, you're doing your routine, you're going to see a massive difference in a relatively short period of time over the course of months. But you better enjoy the process because if you don't enjoy the process, if you don't walk slow, enjoy the process, it's just you're not going to see any results. And so that's my walk slow, smile more method. In fact, right over my shoulder here, if you're looking at this video, my son just this year, by the way, that was 20 years ago, just mm -hmm. this year, my son uh, made that for me for Father's Day. So that goes to show you um, how integral that advice was in my life, the walk slow or walk fast, smile less advice. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah you can you can see this is not what are these normally like 30 minutes? <laughs> just yeah, sorry, sometimes... brother. We're no, this no, is no. gonna be we're gonna go all day long, man. <laughs> Cancel Look. your meetings. Cancel Look, those if, meetings. If anybody's had to run out a long show, it's me. Uh, that was, was one question. Last... One That's question. Great. Ten That's minutes great. in. I love it. That's great. Uh, that makes it for an easy interview because when I got to draw a lot of stuff out, I got to ask more questions. It's a lot harder. Um, I love that idea though of enjoying the process. I think so often, especially in business, people start something and just have this idea of the finish line yeah and they just expect it to arrive overnight and i love how dave ramsey puts it he says yeah i, I busted my tail for 20 years and then i was an overnight success and <laughs> and that's so true like it feels like that so often and um and i always tell people i'm like look life's too short to hate monday like if you if if it's, look, sometimes work is hard. Like that's yeah. fine. Work is we're sometimes it's awful. You know, sometimes it's awful too. Sometimes even it's things, really, really right. hard. Even things that we love, but you know, there there has to be a time where you go. You know what? This I'm, I, I either love the people that I'm working with, or I love the things that I'm doing, or I love the mission that we're on. I always simple too. We did this with our team internally the other day. You don't have to necessarily love all those things either. Yeah. Cause I think you can actually be doing work. That's not like your passion project, mm -hmm. but if you love the people and you love the mission, you love the ideas that can be just as good as loving the actual product in some okay. cases. When I stopped trying to please the people, uh, that I was supposed to be pleasing, like yeah. when I stopped trying to please my bosses, the people interviewing me for jobs, and I've, um, just truly represented myself, my core values, what I thought was funny, how I behaved, how I dressed even. When I embraced that, that's when I feel like I was able to contribute so much more. And so even today uh, with our clients, I, I run a software company, PropFuel, wearing the hat right now. I, I, but when I'm working with our clients, I'm a bit of a goofball, man, sometimes embarrassingly so. And, <laughs> and whether I'm talking to the CEO, of a somewhat big organization or the person that's in charge of the day-to-day -day operations on the project we're working on, no matter who I'm talking with, um, I laugh a lot. I, I make stupid jokes. I put my foot in my mouth all the time. And I find that most of the time it plays well, plays really well, meaning like it's authentic and people yeah. don't understand that. And oftentimes in that scenario, when you end up putting your foot in your mouth, it's much easier to forgive than putting your foot in your mouth um, without being authentic. So uh, that authenticity, and that's an overused word right now, but it, it, it's all part of the same story. There's to find figuring out who you are and being able to embrace that in your business and with your clients. You know, it makes me think about a time I was at the office here and it was in the middle of the summer. We're in Florida and it's like a thousand degrees because yeah. that's what happens here in the summer. And I had shorts on and I had a client show up who actually knew this client. Um, and she yeah, you're, up you're and marketing. She, you're you're, yeah, you're on a marketing right. agency. Yeah, that's right. She walks up and she goes, they let you wear shorts here? And I'm like, they, you know, I own the business. So like, who is they? <laughs> Who's going to tell me I can't? And it's 105 degrees outside. Of course, I'm wearing shorts. Like Get out of here. Suit. I don't want your business. <laughs> you know? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah, no. But it, but I also think in those scenarios, if if somebody really is offended by your authentic self and doesn't a good like fit. that, you don't want to work with them anyway. Yeah, which is really hard 
to acknowledge and embrace that yes. mentality of there may, might be some people that you shouldn't be working with. That's really hard to embrace when you're young in the business. Like when you have a young business, I should say, it's really hard to turn down jobs, opportunities, gigs, contracts that aren't a good fit for whatever reason. Like you want to change your process. You want to change your, your personality. You want to change the, the things, your core competencies just to get that extra buck. And it's so tempting. And sometimes in the early days, you kind of got to do that. But yeah. man, it's so nice when you get to the point where you can say, you know what? It's not a good fit. Yeah, it's interesting because I still sometimes struggle with that. And I mean, I mean I've been doing this yeah, my whole life. Do. I started this business when I was 17. We've been in business 21 years. And yes, I'm like, oh, maybe we could find a way to make it work for them. And thankfully, my team is smart it's enough now to be like, 21. Oh, you're still a kid, man. <laughs> I don't you're know. I've got, five, I've got five kids. So they age me yeah, a lot. Yeah, a kid with five kids. All right. <laughs> and so, you know, you think about that scenario, and um, I, it's still hard to, to not do this, but especially in the early days when you really need the money, like you legitimately like need the money to pay the bills yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But there does come a point where you have to go, this is going to cost me more than I realize. And there's been plenty of times for me where I've taken clients. So that I almost always know I shouldn't have taken. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes it does backfire. Sometimes you get lucky and you get the money and you, you go away unscathed. But uh, you just touched on something really interesting. Is sometimes you need the money, right? And, and uh, I know this podcast is about creating a, a, a business that you can hold on to for the long haul. I, uh, I built and sold a software company. It was pretty long though. It was a 14 year window, but I built and sold the software company. And now I'm four years into my second software company. Um, and I can tell you the first one I built, um, man, I could, I, I could talk to you all day long about the process and the things learned and stuff, but that's, that's for another day, I guess. But, um, the first one, 14 years, I needed to put food on the table. Yeah. In fact, I, let me tell you about that in a second. This one, I got some money in the bank. Somebody bought my last business, so I got some money in the bank. So here we are four years in, and I'm still in startup mode, taking every single thing I have and putting it back into the business. We're not taking anything off the top, which helps us grow this more faster. We're focused on scalability now as opposed and process, as opposed to in that first business, we were focused on what can we do to get money in the door today? So I can go out and when I say we, I meant me, what can I do right now to put food on the table to pay the mortgage? Because I don't want to sell my house. And uh, ideally, I'd like to go on a vacation this year. You know, that's what was on my mind. But I remember back in 2001, when I got fired, uh, and I started that story, but I, I remember walking out to the pier at 10 in the morning, um, and, and this is in Boston. I took a, a ferry from um, my house to, to Boston and then Boston back to where I lived on the South Shore of Boston, where I currently live too. And I remember waiting for the ferry and calling my wife and my Nokia. I don't think it was a flip phone. It was like the uh, the one in the Matrix, you know, Neo has. And yeah. So, so I, I call my uh, my wife and she's got our one and only at the time baby. We got three now. My one baby 20 years ago. And I remember hearing him in her arms coo or make some noise, some baby noise. And uh, immediately, I don't think I said a word and I just broke into tears hearing, uh, hearing the baby because it was the moment that I became an adult. I was 30 years old. It was the moment I became an adult when I realized I've got a new house, a mortgage, a wife who is a stay at home mom now working with the baby and a baby to support. And I had no way to, I had no idea how I was going to do that outside of like three months. So uh, that hit me pretty hard. Um, and uh, I don't know what led me down that path, but needless to say, that led to ultimately a 14 year business. And, but oh, that's it led to ultimately two different kinds of business businesses. The first mm -hmm. one was I needed to put food on the table, I would have done anything, I would have watered plants. The second one, we're being a little more um, uh, discriminant, discriminatory, we're, we're discriminating a little bit better on what jobs we take. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I think 
you know, as people listen to this, there's a lot of different kinds of people that listen. So, some people are thinking, especially in this environment right now, maybe they have been laid off and they've got this idea that they've been talking about doing. And now they're like, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start my own business. Like there's never been a better time. I might as well do it now. Uh, yeah. If, if yeah. anything, this year is creating uh, obviously a lot of pain, but it creates a lot of opportunity. Um, I think that w- when, when countries and economies go through great crisis, um, it's a great, it's like a big reset button. Like somebody hit a reset button and now we got to figure out what are we going to do? You know, that's getting stirred, man. There's right. this, the, the, everything's getting stirred up. And I think it's, you know, even for me, it's, it's been a season of reflecting and going, what do I really want to do? Like every day, Monday to Friday, Sunday to Sunday, really what, what matters? Like what, what makes me feel like I have meaning and impact and, and, and what am I made to do? Like those Have are you found an answer to that? What's your purpose? Yes. Um, my purpose is really the same. It's to help other people grow their business. How we're going to accomplish that, though, is changing slightly in that we're injecting coaching workshops and live events. It seems crazy to talk about live events in the middle of a pandemic, but that's where I'm going. Um, yeah. into you know what? what By the time doing. this is out, we won't be in the middle anymore. That's true. That's right. And, and ultimately, our mission, the reason I'm not making it a separate company just for context, people may be listening, is the mission is the same. So the mission of the primary company, which is was a marketing agency to begin with, is to help other people grow their business. All I'm really doing is adding a coaching wing to that because the marketing agency runs pretty much without me at this point. Yeah. And so now I can focus on the things that I'm really passionate about and I really feel like I'm gifted in. And so I can kind of double down on this consulting slash coaching wing of the business, let the agency continue to run and the software side as well. But missionally, the purpose is the same because I always tell my team, I'm like, look, it's not just about making websites. It's not just about building software or running social media ads. If we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, we're helping other people grow their business. And if we're doing that, we're doing what you said, which is helping other people put food on their tables. Not only that, we're helping other people accomplish their dreams. We're helping other people like provide uh, income for their entire teams. I did the math on this. We're going to talk about it at the beginning of the year with my team. And I'm like, we might help a couple hundred companies in a year. But that impacts tens of thousands of people when you really do the math and spread it out over employees and their clients and everything else. And that's exciting. I used to do the math like that in my last company where we had about 40 employees at, at, at the point at which we sold. And um, I remember every holiday party had come up with some stats just for fun to figure out how many meals yeah. have we provided to our not provided like we didn't cook meals but how many meals could we help our employees put on the table you know if you figure you got you know an average of four yeah. people a family some couples but some have two or three kids you know say four per couple um x number of people in the company x number of meals per day it's awesome to think about how many homes were bought in the time that we were in business how many people were married that actually met in our company there were like three marriages formed just from our little company um yeah there's and that's not even looking outside at our clients that's just employees that's like and that's one of the great things about being an entrepreneur is you're creating uh, not only are you creating a cool product or service, which mm-hmm. I think is just this awesome concept of being a creator as opposed to uh, somebody that helps another person's creations, which is also creating, but I love being at the helm of creation. And then, uh, um, yeah, so anyway, I, I love this concept of creation. And and I think it, the, the employees that you bring on board as part of that creation is just a um, huge upside to entrepreneurship. Yeah, I love it. You know, and I, when I first, what gave me a lot of meaning and purpose in business too, was I operated solo for about a decade. Um, now it was me plus contractors. So I'd use a lot of contractors for all kinds of stuff, but I, it was really just me. There were no W2 full-time employees. And I didn't have my first employee until the economy uh, kind of collapsed in 2007, 2008, whenever that was. Um, because I thought to myself, I think I could create a job for somebody. And so for me, it wasn't about creating the software. It was about creating a job, but it's still creation, right? It's like this, this job did not exist. This person didn't have a full-time salary before, and now they do. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do all these things and that's going to provide for them. And now, you know, we're still not that big. There's 17 of us internally, but that's exciting to me. Like it's, that's, that's part of my 
passion at this point is my job is to serve my team. My team's job is to serve our clients. Creation is an awesome thing. Because when you create a business that's truly unique, that offers some additional value, ideally is innovative in nature, um, you're actually creating wealth. You're not taking wealth from someone. You're creating wealth. It's I, I heard this analogy. I, I think it was in a uh, oh Vern Harnish. I think it was in the um, scaling up. I was just listening to this recently, and uh, he gosh it, or, or traction. I'm, I'm I was listening to both of these things, trying to pick an EOS an operating system for my business now, and uh, one of them said you can um, if you buy a beat up car and you put some blood, sweat, and tears into fixing up this car. Now you might need to buy a few things to fix it up, but for the most part, you're putting hours and hours and hours of effort and work into this car to the point where you have this beautiful, restored, gorgeous car that you can sell for 50 times what you bought it for. You just created that value, right? You created it. You didn't right. take it from somebody else. You didn't take it from the poor and get rich off of it. Yep. You didn't take it from anyone. You created this value. And that's a great example, I think, of how entrepreneurs in general are creating value. That's my number one focus in, in my, my business. And it was in my last business is how do we create more value today? And that's a question I ask myself a lot. How do we create more? Yeah, I think that's a big deal for people to think about as they look to start new ideas or even think about the ideas that they're working on now is what is the value that we're creating? You know, mm -hmm. and ultimately, really, that value is often derived from solving some kind of a problem for the customer. Like, what problem are you solving? And as a result of solving that problem, what value are you creating? Uh, and I think a lot of people couldn't clearly answer that for their business in many cases. Which is it, it, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, and I find that we sometimes back into the problem. <laughs> we have like, we think we're solving a problem. And so we create this product. And this is actually the whole process of finding the product market fit, which I think is yeah. one of the most difficult things as an entrepreneur. But you 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 think you identify a problem, right? And I'm telling you the story of Prop Fuel right now. We thought we identified a problem, which is kind of a problem. And we identified, we created sort of a MVP of a solution for it. And then we get some feedback and we edit the MVP and we turn it more into a solidified product. And then we realize, actually, this solves a different problem problem a little bit better and then we change a little bit more and we realize wait a minute actually there's, there's a problem over here that we're solving and it, so i i think it's it's a little intimidating to me when i hear all the time like first what problem are you solving because sometimes you actually have a really cool hammer and you just don't know what you're going to hit with it yet but you know it's going to make a good tool for hitting things the trick the product market fit is saying this hammer is awesome for this particular kind of nail right like once you've found that match man now that's the gold right but sometimes you don't have the problem the nail you don't know what nail you're gonna hit with this amazing hammer that you've created but the, if you don't find that you're kind of screwed yeah and i think a lot of people but get to stuck start there. with the problem i don't think is always necessarily mm -hmm. necessary that's necessarily necessary. I think that's true. I think it's, out, right? I think it, I think that it just varies. I think some people do start with a problem. So yeah, they realize that they're fixing a problem later. I yeah. did a podcast with a guy a little while ago and he uh, started doing a lawn business. And um, like every kid, I had a little lawn business, you know, me too. a lot more down the street. And me too, brother. The first entrepreneurial venture difference yeah. between me and this guy is he built a $10 million business out of it. I, I was like, well, I didn't do that. Nope. <laughs> Ten, but now $100 business. That's, that's, that's right. Started. That was about what I was at too. Yeah. Uh, but now what? Tens cool of is, dollars. Yeah. He sold that business, uh, did very well, tried to retire, realized he was bored and couldn't retire and needed to go start a new business. Yeah. So now he runs a software platform to help really the idea really it helps the the lawn companies solve the problem because most of those guys they're good at one thing getting up getting their equipment out there cutting the yard and being done yeah they're not great at sending out invoices scheduling yeah. appointments sending out reminders all that stuff and uh, he was kind of solving a problem that he had already known how to fix 
based on his earlier years, but, but he did a lot of market research to validate the idea of yeah. like actually trying. I think that's where a lot of people make mistakes is they, for everybody that's listening or watching, um, when Dave said MVP, doesn't mean most valuable player. It means minimal viable product, which I don't really love that term, but it's the right idea. It's how, what's the least thing we can build to prove, does this work or validate it? Or, or like you said, maybe we just adjust it and we realize, hold on, it's not for that. The hammer's not for that nail. It's actually for this one over here. And yeah. It's really good for that one. So yeah, what's no, your discovery I, I process in that? Like, the, what, what, how, do you, how do you make some of those decisions along the way? Uh, first, I would agree that the, the textbook approach is to identify a problem and create something that solves it. I just think that's extremely hard to do. Uh, it doesn't seem it, but I, I think it's harder than like, it's just, it, it's kind of an idealistic perspective because um, um, if the solution's that obvious, I, I feel like there's, there's probably um, a fair number of solutions already. If, if the solution's obvious, right. sometimes you got to find those things where it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a obscure problem buried somewhere in a niche that not a lot of people are thinking about. And those are a lot harder to find. Um, and usually they're not the problems that you're are floating around at the surface. Um, so how did, how did we find, was that your question? How did we find the process in the yeah, product? Like how, what is your kind of, because what happens with entrepreneurs typically is they have all these different ideas and they don't know which one to go after. And then once they do figure that out, they still struggle with what's the next step to move it forward. And people oh, get yeah. caught in these quagmires and whirlwinds. So what's, what are some things that you've kind of done along the way that have helped you go, all right, the next thing we need to do is this. How do you personally make those decisions as a leader? Oh man, there's so much to say around this. And oftentimes when there's, when there's a lot to say, it's because you don't know what to say. It was a Mark Twain that said, um, forgive me for writing such a long letter, but I didn't have time to write a shorter one. That's right. I feel like I'm going to fall into that trap right now. So I am an endurance adventurer, for lack of a better word. I, I enjoy um, endurance sports. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't just run, I do marathons. I don't just do a marathon, I do a bunch of marathons. I, uh, Ironmans, uh, ultra running, uh, and, which is anything over a marathon. Um, I, I enjoy distance sailing, you know, like uh, that's the, I get enjoyment out of, out of that. Not to say I don't do shorter runs and shorter sails. Um, so the things that require endurance tend to jack me up more than anything else. The reason I say that is because I think there's some similarities between that in this idea of, of running a business, especially as an entrepreneur, it takes patience. And uh, I think you said it earlier, something about an overnight success, you know, a 10, 20 year overnight success. It's uh, most overnight successes. And this, I think this goes without saying most overnight successes are far from an overnight success. They take years. Some are, some are ridiculous. Uh, my buddy's got this business butcher box, you know, they send meat all around mm -hmm. and oh my God, just yeah, like, He's Cambridge guy. Um, I'm in EO with him and uh, he's just killed it. Um, he was an overnight success, man. Like you mm -hmm. can't deny that. He might argue differently, but he'd be lying. Um, so endurance, I think, is critical to finding that product market fit. Number one. Number two, uh, it's funny. People in the early stages when it's just an idea, People are so afraid to, I mean, there's all philosophy out there that I shouldn't talk to anybody. I want anybody to take my idea. You know, don't tell anybody about this, but I want, give me your advice. Oh my God, I just call BS on that because uh, first of all, most people are just so freaking lazy. Nobody's yeah. going to take your idea. It, the ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the execution that really matters. So I talked to everybody about the idea. And in fact, when I was building, when I came up, actually, I didn't even come up with an idea for Prop Fuel. Uh, but as I was coming up for ideas for the next business I wanted to do, um, what I would do is chew on it for a month or two, talking to people about it, thinking, modeling it out, just kind of drawing pictures, writing down some thoughts. And I found that if I had the endurance to go past a month or two, 
it was actually a pretty interesting idea. And if I didn't, if I got bored with it or ran into a wall that I didn't feel like going up over or around, um, then, um, then I moved on. So that's the early, early stage. After the early stage, when you finally pick something, um, to me, the endurance kicks in. This is where it's just a matter of time. And maybe there's better ways to do it. I'm not about to write this book because it's not a sexy book that says, just give it time. Uh, but what we've done, and for better or for worse, you know, here we are four years into Prop Fuel. We didn't find our um, product market fit, I think, to let, I want to say mid pandemic, unrelated to the pandemic, by the way. It was just about when we figured out who we were what it is our value proposition is, mm. who we're selling to, what it is we're selling, where we think we want to take it. Like all of these things are the product market fit. And as a result, Q3 of this year was our best quarter to date. Q4 of this year in 2020 smashed Q3. We mm. nearly doubled the size of our business in the last six months of 2020, which is awesome. Now we're a small business, but still like, it's yeah. awesome, no matter what size you are. Sure. So my point being, having discovered a product market fit had an immense effect on the performance of the business. And so for us, it was just time, trying things, seeing what worked, and being uh, super, super adaptive and flexible and trying new things, giving it enough time, but not too much time, You know, dumping a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there, the endurance is the key factor. I, I love that. I think that's the, that endurance reality is a lot of things that people aren't willing to put up with because it takes hey, a long sometimes time you can't, right? right? Well, that's true. I mean, at some point you can't, you, you've got to have the, the capital. I always say I was really fortunate to start so young because I didn't need to make any money. You know, like I had no yeah. kids. I had no wife. I, I had to start a new thing right now. That's a whole different ball game yeah. with a mortgage and five kids and marriage and everything else than when I was 17, I needed to put like gas in my car. You know, I mean, we made $5,500. We, I mean, I made $5,500 the first year. That's like a hobby. It's not a business, you Yeah. Know? but no, still that's, that's where we're at, you know? Um, so what I'm curious about for you is you had this software company, you'd built it up to a, a pretty large team size. You sell it. Now you've got a new thing, which I assume has a much smaller team because you're kind of in yeah, startup there's mode. four of us right now, four years in, there's only four of us. So, so what was that like going from a scenario where you had people to do all kinds of things to where a lot of it now is going to sit back on you at that team size. Well, tell me about that. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, it was a, it, it was just a reset, you know, it was uh, a bit of a, a slap in the face, uh, not, not, not in like an insulting way, but like a wake up sort of way. Um, it, it, cause you're right. I was so used to focusing on the bigger picture stuff, talking to clients when there was an issue to resolve or when I wanted to just talk to them and get some feedback, dealing with employee issues, working on culture, working on the strategy of the business. Um, but you're right that the granular stuff other people were doing as they, as uh, any entrepreneur should build, a, 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 that, that was correct. That's the way we should have done it. I built, I was the only one in the company and you know, this is an entrepreneur. You're the only one in the company that wants to get so good at your job that you're not necessary, you know? So that's our goal as the owner to make ourselves unnecessary in the business. Whereas employees want to make themselves critical to the business. Right. Um, so starting prop fuel, you know, a friend of mine in EO said to me, Judy, she said, uh, when I told when when I, I was walking through the sale of the business, they were kind of like, "So, what's next? What are you going to do?" And I said, "You know, I think I want to do it again. Like, I think I want to a prove to myself that this wasn't luck of the draw. Prove to myself that this wasn't just I didn't get lucky. I want to prove to myself I'm actually an entrepreneur." And so I think I'm going to do it again and start another business. And she's like, "Did you forget?" all those nights where you're up till midnight, one in the morning, where you wake up first thing in the morning and the first thing you do is open up your laptop. Did you forget about that? <laughs> and uh, I think I kind of did actually, because <laughs> a lot of that happened again. Yeah. And, and you know, but at the same time, 
I'm way more knowledgeable now, and so I can work a little bit smarter than I did the first time around. Yeah, and also, I don't need that money as much. So, so oftentimes, the stuff that needs to get done at midnight or one, I can put off to the next day. I'm a little older, Jay. You know. Well, you don't look it, so there's that. Yeah. Oh, well, you got the beard. I can't grow a beard like that. So. Yeah, I got the gray. I just turned fifty the other day. Oh wow! Yeah. Congratulations! Happy birthday! Thanks. Thanks. I'm I'm uh, about a third there. Something to think about. We just did a life. So speaking of about a third there, which is to the end. You know, we talked about like we did a life plan with our team the other day, and that was that was a dangerous thing to do to take your whole team through a adventure of like what does the end of your life look like? Oy vey. Why would you do that? It was great. I loved it. Um, there was a lot of tears, but it's interesting for me. You talked about like proving to yourself that you could do it again. I think that there's part of me that kind of feels like that too where, right now. Cause I'm like, well, you know, the agency runs pretty well without me. Like I, I mean, I took a month off this summer. We did a big family RV trip around the country. It was one of the best. Oh, we did done. that once. Did yeah. We? 30 footer. Uh, what was it? Cruise America. Yeah. Oh, we did. Man. We rented one from off of a, uh, there's a website outdoorsy.com. It's like, you know, Airbnb for RVs. Yeah, and uh, we ran went off of there and spent thirty three days on the road with all five kids. It was a blast. It was amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a great trip. And that was a big goal for me this year was to be able to build the. I mean, the last five years has been like to get to a place where I could take a month off and the business not only survives but thrives without me. Full cycle of business, right? Sell yeah. new deals, close deals, launch things, and I'm not involved in any of it. And I'm like, this is this to me. That's that was that is success, you know. That's amazing. So you in 33 days, did you, you must have checked in, right? I, the first two weeks I didn't check in at all. So the first really? two weeks, two communication. Weeks. Yeah. No so text. Did people know how to reach you if they needed you. They did, but they told them not to. So, <laughs> but what really for the past like three years, every time I would leave, uh, whether it was for a day or for a week, I would say, look, at any point, if you get to a place where you say, we have to wait until Jay gets back to figure this out, that's a problem that we need to yeah. So let's yeah. solve that problem. And so this year, that was one. My goal was to take 30 days off this year, pre-pandemic. Then the pandemic hit, and I'm like, "Look, we've been playing this for five years. I'm doing it anyway." And um, and it was great. And and so now I do kind of have that feeling of like, "But could I do it again?" Like I started this when I was going back to the original point. I started when I was so young. I didn't need any money. There was really low risk, you know. And I, that's kind of like. I feel like the coaching consulting wing of the business feels like a new startup within the business right now. Cause it's basically me and my assistant running most of that right now. Um, and so I'm spending a lot more time in front of the laptop than I have in a long time. Uh, but it's still within the same genre. It's still connected to the same mothership, if you will. Yeah. So there's a, there's a big safety net. So I am curious, like if I were to who, who do you the think, whole thing, could I do it again? Who do you think we need to prove ourselves to like who, why do we need to prove that we can do it again? If you did it once, you built a successful marketing agency. I built a successful uh, software company. Why do we need to go out there and prove to ourselves? Is it daddy issues? Is it, is it issues with kids? Where like when I was, I remember very clearly being in high school. And I was a little pudgy and and um, fairly short. And um, I remember after the prom taking my shirt off at the beach. You know, we would go to the beach after the prom. And I remember a, a friend of mine, um, uh, it was a very hurtful moment. You know, all the girls around and a friend of mine uh, sees me with my shirt off and my, my dimples and my, my belly and stuff, which actually probably lends itself to exactly why I, I, I've run all these marathons and Ironmans and stuff because this, this shit sticks. Yeah. And he's like, hey, hey, Jelly Donut, JD. And they called me JD. That was my nickname for a little while. And it sucked. Totally sucked. So is this all part of um, proving to myself that um, uh, I'm, I'm worthy? You know, like, who, why, who do we prove this to? What do, you, what do you think? Are you do you run? Into, do you have some daddy issues going on there, Jay? I mean, yes. <laughs> We're gonna yeah? get, I mean, my my parents got divorced when I was sixteen. I started the business the next year. Um, so whether that's a coincidence or not, I don't think that. What it was is. your relationship like? I was I was it you was know daddy good. issues cause a lot of things. But I, I didn't talk to my dad for a decade, basically. Um, yeah. So I, you want to prove to him that you're I worthy, right? To my wedding, you know, and because um, I didn't know how to repair that relationship, and obviously neither did he, and. Um, and so, yeah, part of that, part of that for me was 
you know, I'm also like, I love personality profiles and stuff like that. I'm a three on the Enneagram. And ultimately the deep question in my personality type is like, are you good enough? Do you have what it takes? And often my inner critic, even now, like I have scaled this business. We've grown every single year as of today, actually, for 21 years in a row. We barely squeaked out this year <laughs> with a week to go, but we did it. You've grown um, every year for, how, for every year, how many years for again? 21 years in a row. Wow. That's and, uh, a massive accomplishment. Not a single down a bit. No, not a Especially with a service organization. Your your business is service? Primarily, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's incredible because every year, man, you start at zero again. Well, kind of. Yeah, well, we've developed a lot of recurring revenue streams. So like we'll have like maintenance contracts, hosting contracts, oh, good. support okay. contracts, marketing retainers. So yeah. now probably 75% of our business is recurring revenue. Yeah. So, but even that I learned this year, I put so much faith in that. And turns out recurring revenue is only as good as the people who can keep paying it. So there's that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's significant. 75% being recurring revenue. That's more than my last software company where we were 66% uh, recurring revenue when we sold and done. So the 75%, that's far more than I thought based on the, what you yeah, just worked really hard at it. Uh, that's been a primary focus. But I remember years ago, my uncle said to me, I was just going project to project building basic websites back then, you know, for a couple hundred bucks at a time when I was that age. And um, he said, you got to find a way to develop recurring revenue, you know, to, to build a scalable business and also not so you don't have to feel like every single month you're starting from zero. Every single year you're starting from zero. Yeah. And uh, cause yeah. we were, and but I remember the first thing I ever sold was a website hosting account. I think I paid $4 for it a month. I resold it for $10 a month and made $6 a month. It was $120 annual contract 10,000 of those and you're making money man yeah now we've got 2.1 million dollars in recurring revenue but it all started with 120 dollars a year yeah um, and so I, I think how big is your team 17 yeah it's a nice size that's a do you consider your business a lifestyle business um yes yeah, yeah. because I'm not you know I won't I don't work well I didn't used to until I launched this coaching wing I don't I didn't work more than 40 hours a week um, at this point, I, um, I took a whole month off this year, like I said. Um, but, but I also do have this like desire to keep growing, which constantly is being challenged now. Like, do I really have to keep growing? Yeah. Like it you did 2.5 last man. year. Do you really have to do 2.7 this year? Like you did two, does it really have to, and that's where I'm kind of, yeah. I'm trying to do a counseling session, but <laughs> no, <laughs> I think I'm those are some, are you a part of EO entrepreneurs organization? I'm not, no. It's a cool, you know, I, so I do the podcast for EO. Can I, can I give it a little plug here? Sure. Absolutely. So it's, it's, we interview entrepreneurs, conversations, very similar, similar to this, but, but I, I get people more, um, more, more impressive than me. And, um, and, uh, like Vern Harnish, for example, I mentioned him earlier scaling up. He's coming yeah. on in January. Oh, wow. Second That's time actually. Awesome. Uh, but I've gotten to, like the founder of California Closet. So I'll interview wow. these people and I try to get their stories. I try to get into more. I don't want to learn from them as much as I want to understand them. You know, like we can learn from them by reading their books or watching videos of them. I want to understand them. What, how did they get to where they are and what are they, what are their aspirations? Like what were their daddy issues? You know, that's, yeah. I should make a podcast called daddy issues. <laughs> anyway, so, but this it's called EO 360 entrepreneurs organization 360. And, um, we've got like 150 episodes or something, maybe a little South of that. Uh, but anyway, EO, I'm a big fan. I like it. Uh, they have the prime, the main members are a million plus in revenue. Um, and, uh, uh, but there is an accelerator program for people between 250 and a million. Um, uh, there's 14,000 members worldwide, maybe 15,000 now uh, worldwide. So it's it's this great network, uh, but it's not about networking. It's about uh, everything you're talking about, like processing challenges and issues. And so there's my advertising for EO. I'm a, I'm a member. I, I'm not at all involved in the organization other than I'm a member. I do the podcast because I love it. And I've been a member for 10 years. Wow, cool. That's awesome. Cool group. Yeah. There's been a, I do think the groups like that of, of some sort are just so important. Uh, you know, there's Vistage, me. there's YEO, which is a, I'm YPO, Young President's yeah. Organization. That one's tougher to get into. Um, yeah. yeah I just joined, uh, so for a long time, it's not as formal as any of those that you just mentioned, but 
uh, Dave Ramsey has an organization called Entree Leadership within his main company, and they teach their business practices, and then they have kind of a community around that. And yeah. they'll do like monthly advisory groups and calls and things like that. And that has been, I mean, just transformative for me because I didn't go to business school. I didn't, like, I just have been winging it for 21 years, you know? Yeah, you saved and, yourself some good money. Yeah, that's right. Dan and, Sullivan has a great group too, Strategic Coach, I think it's called. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm reading one of his new books right now. Um, he was on my podcast too. Wow, he's awesome. you got some amazing guests. Awesome. In fact, he's the one, I just interrupted you. I'm sorry, I want to hear- fine, you're good. The, but I want to hear about this book you're reading of his, but uh, he's the one that that convinced me to have a long view of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he said he's going to live to 140 something. Um, that's his plan. He's like a lot of people, they just imagine themselves dying at 88 mm -hmm. and they do. Now, is there a relationship between that? Maybe, maybe not. But he's like, I'm going to plan to live to 140. Well, for me, I, I'm actually going to plan. I want to see the turn of the next century. I want to see. Uh, I want to see us hit 2100. And so for me, that's. I was born in 1970. So for me, that's. Uh, I got to hit 130. That's wow. my goal. Then I'm good. I'll, I'll. I'll go there. The way things are going, there better be a massive improvement in prosthetics. Uh, I. <laughs> I. That's the, right. the ability to like replace my hip. Again, like that, I got to work on that part. And I'm going to keep doing Iron Man. You got a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. so what's this there. book you're reading? The strategic. Uh, oh, his uh, Dan Sullivan's new book is called Who Not How. Ironically, he didn't even write it. Yeah. He had another guy write it. And that was the whole point to some extent of the book is he like he just hired this guy to write his book. It's his ideas. Uh -huh. Like he talked about it and had conversations and all that. Yeah. And then the guy went and took it and wrote it. Um, and it's a, the book, in essence, is exactly what the title is like. It's not a matter of how do we get something done. It's who do we need to help us get that thing done? Um, yeah, I think um, so. He's involved with uh, um, Joe Polish. If you're familiar with Joe Polish, uh, Tucker Max might be the one he had write the book. Uh, mm -hmm. He's he's the guy that, that wrote, I hope they serve beer in hell. Um, but Tucker <laughs> Max now, he's another one I had in the podcast. He has a... Uh, uh, a business, I forgot the name of it, but he has a business where basically they'll write the book for you. Um, yeah. You just got to dictate it. And it's anywhere between like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to have a book out. Yeah. Uh, and they'll make sure that you get on one of the bestseller lists, which apparently is quite easy. You just got to find the niche. Maybe it's not the Wall Street Journal or New York right. Times, but it'll be some Number one Amazon in some bestseller. category on Amazon, right? That's yeah, why I hear yeah. uh, bestseller author, best-selling author, and I'm like, ugh, roll my yeah. eyes on that one again. Yeah, I wrote my first book uh, a couple years ago, and uh, but I did it all myself. I had an editor who helped me with the structure and stuff, uh, which was really great. But it was a great exercise to go through. What was the book about? It's the same title as the podcast, actually. It's called Building a Business That Lasts. And the subtitle is Without Sacrificing Family. Um, because going back to the lifestyle question, for me, like, if I build a hundred million dollar business and I help change the world, but I don't get to stay married to the same woman because of that, or my five children don't know who I am at the end of the day, that doesn't matter. And, um, and so I had a, somebody asked me at the end of a podcast the other day, it was a really powerful question. They said, uh, last question, this was a big last question. Uh, what do you want to be known for? And, it was a marketing podcast. So I think they were wanting like some niche within marketing or something, you know? And I was like, well, it really depends on who's doing the knowing because I want my wife to know me for different things than I want my clients to know me for maybe a same general character of who I am as a person, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not like, I don't want to be known for like being the king of websites, you know, <laughs> like that's, I have no interest in that. And, um, I don't know where, where I was going with all that, but I think well, that, you're talking about your family and, and I think you're, I, I think I know where you're going. You don't want your kids to think of you as the king of websites. Right. I want to no, I, dad. It's interesting. I've, I've never thought of, about that in depth, that question, and maybe I'm just latching myself onto what you're saying, but uh, I'm not sure I really care what anybody thinks about me when I'm gone, aside from my kids. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's just my kids that I care about. And I want them to, um, 
I, I want them to cry every time they think about me. That's how much I want them. That's how much I want them to love me and miss me. No, that's awful. I actually, I, but I really do want my kids to to die. On, I want them on their deathbed. Uh, hopefully, way way. Hopefully, they make it to two hundred. But I want them on their deathbed with nothing but fond memories of me. You know, in terms of plus all their other memories. But if I guess that's the only thing I care about in terms of a legacy, I think. Yeah, so that my one of my favorite things as it relates to that is uh, the eulogy that George W. did for his dad, George H.W. I didn't hear it. What was it? It's worth watching. So like just Google, you know, George W. eulogy of father. And here's a guy who was president of the United States, whose father was president of the United States, whose brother was the governor of one of the largest states in the country. Yeah. Um, and all he does in that eulogy is talk about like who his dad was as a dad. He didn't talk about his accomplishments. I mean, he like glazed over them, but the part that really got him, the part that really mattered was like who his dad was, yeah. not the fact that he was the president of the United States or the vice president under Reagan or none of that mattered. It just mattered that he didn't allow those things, which is like, there's no harder job be a horrible job. Um, awesome. I used to think I wanted to be president. It'd be a horrible job. No. Um, and he didn't allow those things to interfere the reality of like what his primary job was, which was to be the father to his kids. And I was like, whoo, man, you can't watch that without, you know, getting a little dust in the eye because it's, it's intense. So yeah, I, there's a lot of things. I, I have this um, five-year vision of, you know, what I want the world and my world to look like in five mm -hmm. years, which by the way, I, 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 I'm such a huge believer in visioning. Um, I do not believe in this, the concept of the secret. You're familiar with the book, the secret. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think it's a bunch of garbage. Uh, it pisses me off actually, but there's a philosophy in there that I subscribe to. And so when I say it pisses me off, what pisses me off is giving people hope that if they hope for a bike, um, that they're going to end up with a bike on the front door soon enough. What I like about it is this idea of visualizing what it is that you really want. I think that's really important. And so I, I, I use this book, I got it behind me somewhere called um, uh, The Compass, The Personal Compass. I think that's what it's called, The Personal Compass uh, by Grove, G-R-O-V-E. It's like 50 bucks. Don't buy it on Amazon for 250 or 400. You can go to find it like Grove, um, you buy it directly from them. It's like 40 or 50 bucks for this giant oversized workbook. It is phenomenal, phenomenal. About eight hours of work to map out what's important to you. How are you spending your time? And what do you want life to look like for you in an undetermined period of time? Like you pick the time frame: three years, five years, 20 years. Uh, and it kind of gives you a personal strategic plan is what it is. And, and so I have a summarized version of that up on my wall. It has a lot of stuff like how much, you know, the, the, the material things I want, the uh, sentiment I want with my family, uh, who I want around me. Mm -hmm. But it's this, this like Cameron Harold's painted picture. Uh, another guy that was on the podcast, actually. Like like the painted picture by Cameron Harold of for you personally, and I think that is really really important to visualize that. I, I'm working on getting my kids to visualize what their life looks like in five or ten years from now, because I think if you visualize it, it's far more likely to happen. Yeah, you know it's so interesting that you're bringing this up because this is it's really the, kind of very similar to the exercise I did with my team last week. Hmm. Uh, now I get it. Yeah, now so I get I told it. People, yep publicly, we actually went through a, a newer curriculum that just came out, but it's a similar concept. It's by Donald Miller called Hero on a Mission. And the idea is like, he says, fate is a horrible writer. And, and so if you don't have a story for yourself, then it's not going to go very well. And then this exercise, he makes you start with uh, writing your obituary. And uh, Michael Hyatt does this in Living Forward. Stephen Covey told people to do it before that. Like none of this is new. And, and ultimately what you're doing is writing this vision, which you already just stated, like when my kids are on their deathbed, that's even past your death. You're visualizing even farther beyond your own death. But in this, it's like basically at your death, what would you want your kids to say about you? And how far are you? What, what's the delta between where you are now and what you actually want them to say? 
And when you have to write that down on paper, it's like, whoo, that's intense. And then what we do actually after that is we craft a 10 year vision in, in a couple different categories and then kind of a five year vision and then a one year vision. So one year is almost more like a goal sheet than it is a vision at that point. But, um, but it was a really powerful exercise. And I told people ahead of time, I was like, look, I realized this is a relatively risky thing for me to do as an employer who likes his team, because yeah. I might give you a vision that why. means you're not here anymore. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, I am 100% okay with that because my greatest desire for you personally within this company is for you to grow. And so my vision for my team is not that my team would produce the most profit possible over time, although I like profit too. You got to have profit to stay in business. It's that they, when they leave here, they would go, wow, that was time well spent. I grew professionally. I grew personally. I'm a better person because I was here, mm -hmm. whether that's six months, six years, or 20 years. Um, but it was powerful. I mean, we did it all over Zoom just so people had their own little private space and we didn't come into the office and stuff. How long did were, that, did people work on that on their own and then bring it to the table or you all worked on no, it and came together? It's a workshop that actually, and I was somewhat testing it because I'm going to start teaching this workshop. The first one I'm doing is January 13th, actually. So we're going to make this a public workshop that we sell essentially as a product. How long um, was it? It takes about five hours. And you did so that on Zoom, five hours in Zoom? Yeah, it was brutal. Um, but it was it was good because it, it's broken up and it's designed to kind of work that way. Yeah. Um, it would be better in person, but there is some value in it being over Zoom because people kind of have their private space because it gets emotional and they can hit that, turn the camera off for a minute if they need a little, you know, cry yeah. moment because most people cry when they go through this exercise because uh, it's intense, but it's fun. It was a great exercise. Did you cry? Yes. When I read my eulogy or my read my obituary back, I, I do tear up for sure because, yeah, because I think like, man, this is what I want my wife to say about me when I'm dead. This is what I want my kids to say about when I'm dead. And I know that I'm not that person yet, you know, but to go back to, to tie this circle all the way back, it, it's about the journey too. It's about recognizing that and, and enjoying along the way, moving towards that desired future. And yeah. Um, I love that, man. We're way yeah. over time. You were right about that. No, I'm telling you, man. Get oh. get me on. Get put a mic in front of me. All of a sudden, <laughs> it's it's a few hours is going to go by. Well, uh, I would like to wrap up with three questions, even though we're a little over. That's okay. Another uh, thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, right. that's right. Three quick questions, okay? That are big questions, but you know, it, look, this is on your schedule. My afternoon's open, okay? Um, is number one, what does work life balance mean to you? And how has that changed through different seasons of your life? I realize that's two questions, but let's just make it one. Number two, uh, where's the best people to place for people to find you online, learn more about you, learn what you do? And then the last one, just parting advice uh, for other entrepreneurs to build a business that lasts. So let's start with the first one. Work-life balance. Work-life work balance. Life. What, what does it mean to you? It means something different to everybody, I think. And how has that changed through different seasons of life? I'm... Um, what is work? So work-life balance, uh, it's, it's funny. Earlier in my life, when I was working for somebody, work-life balance was very, very, um, they were separate. You know, I worked at work and I had life after work. And, um, and the problem is I tried to squeeze life into work and that led to um, um, advice to walk faster and smile <laughs> less. So I, uh, they were totally separate. Um, what I discovered fairly quickly was that if you don't work like you like to live, um, you're not going to do it very well. And so in order to get better as in my work life, I brought my personal life into it. And so now there is, I don't want to say there's no difference. I mean, I'm sitting here in my office. I'm talking to you, not my kids, but I enjoy this. Like I'm digging this. I'm, I'm dressed the same way I'm going to dress when I hang out with my family this weekend. I'm talking the same way I'm going to talk when I'm hanging out with my buddies. I'm, I'm, I, the, my thought process, this idea of constantly chewing and thinking through things is the same as it's going to be on a Friday night. So work and life for me, uh, 
have completely blended. Now there is a downside to that. And the downside is uh, I don't recall the last time I took 33 days without checking my email. In fact, I don't remember the last time I spent a day without checking my email. Uh, hours usually, um, if that, uh, and or texts or something else on my phone. So my phone's always with me. Um, and that's not a healthy thing. It, it takes attention away from the family. Um, the only time I can think of was actually when I sailed up from, I sailed from St. Thomas uh, to Boston. And uh, so mostly offshore, totally out of any kind of service. We had a satellite phone in case we needed it, but I went eight days on the open water without any kind of email. That was the only time in the past 20 years, actually, since email came out that I can think of being away from email. It wasn't that bad, actually. <laughs> I nothing, a, nothing burned down. I'll admit I'm a self-professed um, email addict. So what'd I you do to, on the, the RV trip, the I 30 to, days? I have to physically remove it from everything. Like I, I can't have it on my phone. I have to like delete all my accounts off my phone. Come on. Yeah. So you're, you're, you need your phone for the camera, right? That's like right. you use the camera on that trip, taking pictures of kids, the Grand yeah. Canyon. But you're telling me you removed the Gmail app or whatever it is you use. Yeah. You took it off. I deleted it off my phone. And I know a guy who actually took it one step further because his addiction problem was even worse than mine. Although mine might be almost that bad. Because I mean, I felt like I had physical withdrawals. I, I kid you not. Like I felt like I needed to go check my email. Like I'm an like I'm a drug addict. I mean, it was bad. And uh, I know another guy though. He went to so such a far extreme that he had his assistant change the password on his email and not tell him the password. Oh, and I like that. The because only way he could get into the email was to contact her to get into it. So then he had to like feel the shame of like failure, basically, like <laughs> by calling her and saying, "Hey, I really need to get in this video to That's check good. it," and and that worked. But for me, I do have to physically take it off because what I uh, the problem that I know that I have is I can't see something and then leave it alone. So like when I see something that needs yeah. to be dealt with, I need to deal with it for better That's, or worse. Yeah, and I, can't, I, I just know. can't leave it alone. And even if I can physically leave it alone, it's like taking up at least, you know, 15% of my capacity up here. And that's not healthy. So I, know, I had to do that. I'm with you. I had a client ask me a question last night over email. It wasn't urgent, but it, you know, it was a question about how to do something. And they wanted advice about something related to our software. And I saw it around seven. And I was like, I'll, I'll get to that tomorrow. Anyway, nine o'clock. Yeah, I see my right. laptop. I'm like, I, right, let me, I'm just gonna just real quick. I'm gonna I know. So that's work life balance is at nine o'clock. I'm sitting there with my laptop talking into Loom. By the way, great tool, Loom or Love Vidyard. Loom. It, the, Vidyard is another one. They're both amazing tools to help you interact with people with video, screen share, copy a link and send it. But anyway, I, I do a lot of interaction with our clients like that. And so here it is 9pm. I, I could be talking to my wife, talking to my kids. Instead, I'm talking to our client about it's just a five minute quick video, but yeah, that's work-life balance for me for better or for worse. That's what it is. Yeah. I've even thought about, although my, the phone, the camera on my phone is so good. I can't imagine using anything else at this point, no. but um, I, I saw this great talk by Simon Sinek one time and he was talking about just like the impact of what, like what the phone does in our own environment in our own oh, life. God. And he's up on stage Simon. and he's talking and you know, and he's, he's just, you know, kind of going through the motion and, and he kind of goes from one topic to the next. And he says, now, what, what I want you to realize is that as soon as I picked this phone up and put it in my hand, you felt slightly disconnected from me. You felt something different than when I didn't have that phone in my presence. Yeah. And I was like, shoot. No, so that is recently... true. That's very true. I'm so sick of the social bashing, the social media bashing, the phone bashing. We're ruining our kids bashing. Uh, you know, there's changes and there is a lot of negative with it, but there's a lot of positive too. And yeah. I, I just can't stand all the bashing. That's why I roll my eyes when somebody like Simon Sinek gets up. I, I think he's got a great start with why. Love it. Your point just now is really, really valid. Yeah. There's a phone, like even if they're not looking at it, like I've seen people, their phones on the table and you're talking to them and it's flashing because it just did something. They got a text and it's flashing and they're looking at you. They're ignoring it drives me bonkers, man. Like I'm, it's distracting me 
to see you buzzing. So in I just so speaking of EO, I just joined a different organization a couple months ago called C12, which is like a Christian CEO forum, similar concept to some extent. And what they make us do in this and this is like a local mastermind group. So you get together, it's a full day once a month, it's a pretty big commitment, but it's it's been great so far. And uh, they have a box outside. Everyone puts their phone in the box when you go into the meeting. There are no phones. That's inside, good. That's good. That's order. healthy. And it's yeah. impactful. And I also twitch for the first two hours needing my phone next week. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So two last questions. And we will we'll yeah, actually contact. land this plane. You, you Where can do we find you, you online? Uh, so my company is Prop Fuel, P-R-O-P-F-U-E-L. It's a uh, it's it's an engagement platform. And now you can use it for employee engagement. You can use it for, but, but it's really designed now to be used for member engagement or client success. Um, but it's a, it's an engagement platform way to get your constituents more involved in a two-way conversation via, um, with using technology. Um, so www.propfuel.com. You can reach me at Dave at propfuel.com. Um, I, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. I mean, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, David R. Will, I think is the handle for LinkedIn, but you know, email me if you want me. Great. And then last thing, uh, parting advice for people that want to build a business that lasts. That's a wide open question. So it really is. People within today. I mean, I, that's a super wide open question. And as a result, I think I'll, I'm going to pick the theme and probably my strongest core value, which is the walk slow, smile more mentality. And, but the, the, to put some context around that, I think the, what I want to encourage anyone to do just to be, become the best version of themselves. And, and the way you do that is you stop being what it is you expect the person in front of you to be, you know, we all, uh, um, interact with people in our lives and we try to be what they want us to be, whether it's a client, a boss, maybe your employees, gosh, maybe your spouse. But um, when you do that, you're giving up um, your ability to perform as the best you possible. And, and so I discovered that around 30 uh, and it, it completely changed my world when I just, it was just comfortable in my own shoes, finally. That is great advice and something that I always need to hear because I'm a bit of a chameleon. I love uh, yeah. I love we being loved are. by other people and want to be liked as well. And so yeah, uh, me too. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly working on. Dave, it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel like I've been interviewed on my own podcast today, but that was great too. I hope it uh, brings value to everybody else that's listening. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Hey, I hope this video has helped you with some tips and ideas to build a business that lasts. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on the next videos that we roll out. And more importantly, for some awesome free resources, head over to our website at buildingabusinessthatlasts.com. You can get a free copy of my book there where I tell you how I have built an agency that's grown year over year for the last 20 years in a row. So go grab that, buildingabusinessthatlasts.com, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks. We'll see you soon.